Okay, we're recording. This is just a quick uh, uh, break here for a moment. Uh, I was mentioning this tracker module I had here. I modified it. This tracker module I had here, I modified it slightly so that I could demo it for you and turned everything else off. Uh, when you're dealing with a complex particle system like this, or a series of linked particle systems, or event-driven particle systems, and this is probably true no matter what system you like to use, or you're using Maya, or Max, or XSI, or what have you, um, what I like to do is I'll put in like a tracker, and what that lets me do is it puts in a little trail behind each particle. See, and you can see them here, these little yellow dots. And this goes back to, you know, do you have your, do you use, li why you would use lines over, uh, over dots, see. If you use dots, this is what you get, these big thick dots. And that's fine. You know, you can see where everything is. But if you have like a whole ton of these things, and you really want to know where they're going, I like lines because they're much finer. You get a lot more detail. And if you're dealing with something like something that you don't really use a lot, like say a radial drag and you don't or a cylindrical drag and you don't really 100% know what all of these variables do, it's a good way of kind of looking at them going, oh, okay, now I get it. Now I have a better understanding of what these things are doing. And you can turn this up to say 100%. And now you're like, oh, got it. Okay, now I see. And you can increase the age of death by say, you know, let's double that so our trailers, trails are longer. And we can even uh, have them inherit more speed so that the lines themselves are a little longer and stronger. And if you have something where you're not 100% sure what you're looking at, this is a good way where you can you can start being able to tell what this radial drag does. And you can also do the same go here and go. Okay, so now okay, now it doesn't want anything it is tangential drag opposite of radial drag. Got it. Okay, axial drag. I'll bet I'll know what that does. And you'll see, yes, everything kind of flattened out relative to its vertical axis, but still is spreading out this way. And it gives you a chance to figure out how to use different effects in a way that might be more useful, and it permits the happening of the finding of happy accidents and lets you use your tools a little bit more fully and you're getting some better feedback than you would have otherwise had. See now we have like kind of an orbital cylindrical thing going on there. Then when you're done you just pull that off and you start again, and they're gone. And everyone goes, oh, how'd you get that nice little spirally thing that just dispersed that way? It's like, oh, because I'm a genius. That's why. Ha ha. All right. So we don't need any of that, though. We aren't doing any of that. Delete you. Delete you. And because, as we pointed out earlier, we left our cache, view our cache viewport set to manual update, we still have all of our particle system cached in and I can pick up where we left off with squibs hitting the walls uh, physics objects falling as they're supposed to do um, looks like a whole mess going on there I'm gonna touch briefly on the physics of how these um, bottles are breaking because the bottles here, if I select the targeting system, if we select our particle system, you'll notice 
those these particles here aren't the bottles themselves. The particles the bottles are emitting more particles to make them look more breaky. And those are part of the whole greater particle flow system. And how that's happening is is we'll go down here, there's rifle rotation, there's grass position, and here's broken bottle. You'll notice that the broken bottle, I'm not using particle uh flow, I'm not using toolbox three or any of that. I wish I were, but I'm not. Again, we don't know what people coming down the road are going to have access to, so we have to use things that everyone will have access to uh, for the purposes of this proof of concept. And so let's turn off our displays for things that we don't need to look at. And that means I don't need to see all these lines. I don't need to see the squibs. I don't need to see the squib shrapnel. I don't see, need to see the wall chips. Um, don't really need to see all these uh, space warps. We're just looking down here and watching bottles break. Okay. And that's the other nice thing about particle flows that you can turn all that stuff off independently of each other. So what we're doing is, uh, first thing we're doing right here is we have put uh, about 300 particles onto about 250 objects. So each one of these guys, I could have written a small script that would have put one or two particles on each physics object. Um, yeah, you know, I didn't do that. Uh, I just said, okay, here's 300 particles, lock onto these 250 objects. I'm counting on most of you having a particle or two on you. I don't really, it's, it, it didn't have to be that specific. We aren't breaking ground tiles or anything like that. Uh, put them on the surface, and then rather than actually do anything, any collision detection, what I did was I detected movement and speed. Okay? So when these physics objects, when the bottle physics objects are hit by the projectiles, they start to move. When they start to move, that triggers uh, our velocity magnitude test, which then lets us have gravity. This gravity is not real gravity, this gravity is actually the same gravity that's driving our um, our target's detection particles. So they are getting pushed out in that direction. And they're inheriting the uh, velocity of the physics object as well. So they're inheriting, these particles are inheriting the physics object velocity and getting the wind from the gun barrel because we want everything to go in that direction. And then they are going to be big old chunks. And each of these chunks will immediately spawn several little chunks. Uh, roughly 90% of them are going to spawn three little chunks and everybody will live for about 12 to 20 frames and then die and that's it and these green lines you're seeing here these are uh, constraint objects that uh, that mass effects rigid bodies have to use so that they don't just collapse so that so that when one part of the bottle is breaking it knows that hey, everything is breaking. Um, not a fan of Mass Effects right now, but maybe it will grow on me. So, that is pretty much how this whole thing works. I'm r really proud of how it turned out, uh, in spite of its, uh, you know, kind of couple little flaky points, but I think for the most part it turned out really good. Uh, there are a couple of renders here. Let's play through them really fast. In all likelihood, I'll just play the actual renders and I'm just uh, setting these out for time. 
So this we can see our guy walking through the grass and firing his machine gun and the light is illuminating his surrounding area. And you'll notice that there is some uh you can see underneath the ground here that would be covered by another pass of another foreground pass of render and then in the background obviously that'd be a background pass of rendering as well and it doesn't really matter if the light reaches that far because it's just a gun burst and I don't think I would care that much uh also let us look at the squibs being rendered out Okay, so squibby squib squibs. We can see objects breaking. We can see your physics objects breaking. We can see the pink marks indicate where there would be wall breakage. The 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 pink marks indicate our squibs. The green marks indicate our uh, our wall chips coming off of those squibs. And we talk about this because it might not be super obvious that those are there immediately, but you can kind of see them, the, the wall chips here. And you, you can see the wall chips here, and you can see the uh, dust coming off, but it comes by really quickly, and the bottle breaks kind of dominate that. So, you would want you know, I, I just wanted to show the untextured version first so that you could see a bit of how that worked. And, and so you would know where you were looking at and know that, oh yes, it is in fact actually working correctly. Points as well. Okay, so here we have the guy walking from back in the hill and you can see from a distance that looks pretty reasonable. Now, you'll notice that the gun has quite a bit of jitter here. I think this is the last thing that I fixed, and I didn't even mention it here, was uh, if you look at early renders of this, early tests of this, uh, there was a whole lot of gun jitter, and it looked like uh, our guy had some sort of palsy. So, let's take a moment here. Stop that, and uh, I assume we're still recording. Yes, good. And I, I want to show you how how we fixed that problem, how we fixed that particular challenge. If you go down here to the gun, you'll notice that there's a box right here. All right, and the box is is what is actually doing our spawning. And the, the box is doing the actual looking at, the box is linked to the gun. So if I move the gun, the box, the blue box goes with it. The blue box that you probably can't see terribly well. Let's change the color of the blue box to something we can see better, like pink. And down there, there we can see it a little bit better. Okay? And the reason we did that is if you, uh, Go all the way back to the beginning. And let's look at our key information. We have a couple look at constraints here. All right. We uh, are looking at our search volume and we're looking at our dummy. Our gun isn't looking at our dummy anymore. And because when it looked at our dummy, that's when it looked like our biped had some sort of palsy. Our box is still looking at our dummy. It has the option of looking at the search volume. It has the option of looking at what I call the dummy breaker, which forces uh, us to target a specific object if we want that object shot at. But uh, let's not worry about the dummy breaker right now. But principally, it's looking at the dummy. The, the gun is looking at the search volume, which if we turn it right back on, unhide it is uh, this guy right here. So it, the, the gun is still looking right ahead of itself all the time. 
And this is important because now it doesn't look like he's completely spastic. Uh, it was a simple matter to write a quick script so that, let's follow our gun around here, and you'll see that the box is not lined up with gun barrel. The, 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 this is following uh, the target. This is following the, uh, the, the target detection particle system. And it's kind of wandering all over the place. But you'll notice that once the, uh, the gun starts firing off its bullets here, some uh, keyframes are created. And if we look at it right now, we have a dummy vol a dummy uh search weight of 100 all right and we can see that this is now much more lined up with the gun so that as he's firing the uh the biped is you know is kind of fighting to hold on to the gun as he's firing but it is not actually, you know, when, when he's not firing, he steadies out and levels out. It is the upshot there. And that, that's what we have going on with that. So, that was the last point I wanted to mention. It was uh, kind of cool putting all this together. Let's do one more, let's look at one more render from behind of this. I'm firing from uh, this area over here. This should be it. And he's going through the grass and shooting a gun. And, and it looks like he's actually going out there and shooting stuff out in the field. And this would be about the distance the camera angle we would want to use this kind of particle effect for um, because you don't want to look too close at too much of it but it does get a lot done for what it is doing anyway thank you very much for your time I hope this has been helpful and informative to someone out there how do I turn off Camtasia now I guess is my next question there it is okay